welcome to EuroPCR 2021 and the symposium entitled Planning for Long Run, Lifetime Management of Bioprosthetic Valve Implantation, sponsored by Medtronic. My name is Stefan Mindecker from Bern, Switzerland, and it's my pleasure to co-chair the symposium with my colleague and cardiovascular surgeon Hendrik Trede from Mainz, Germany. I also wish to welcome our discussant Eberhard Grube, as well as our expert speakers Mohammed Abdel Wahab and Lars Sondergaard. As TAVI has been established as alternative to surgical aortic valve replacement across the spectrum of risk, we, address, we wish to address the following objectives which are relevant for the lifetime management. Which patients fare better with TAVI than surgery and vice versa? What do we learn from the longest available follow-up data? And what are practical considerations in the decision-making process of patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis? I also take the opportunity to ask you to actively use the chat function to interact with us, and we will do our very best to address your questions during the discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who will be Hendrik Rede, a cardiovascular surgical colleague and expert TAVI operator who will talk about TAVI where it is equal or better compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to talk about TAVI and where it's equal or better compared to SABRE. These are my conflicts of interest. When we speak about the choice between TAVI and SABRE, we usually think about risk-based decision-making. So it's a clear cut that we have a high surgical risk, the patient gets a TAVI, if the risk is very low and TAVI is even more possible than, of course, it's surgery. But for many patients, it's in between. And for those patients, we have to find good ways on deciding which treatment is the best for them on a personal basis. We know from the Evolute Loris trial that even in Loris patients, TAVI is not inferior to surgery, at least when it comes to the composite endpoints of death and disabling stroke. So we have to ask ourselves, what influences our choice of therapy? And we also have to answer the question, what is most important to our patients? For SABRE, of course, we have longer-term data on durability. We have less PBL, although PBL is not such an issue anymore after TAVI. We have lower pacemaker rates for sure. We have the combination of cabbage maze and LA occlusion, if possible, yes. And it may be the clinician's preference. But when it comes to TAVI, we have a reduced risk for AFib. We have less bleeding, less renal failure. We have better hemodynamics, better valve areas. We have faster return to activities, shorter lengths of stay, and very often, TAVI is the choice of the bread of the patient. So we potentially need to change our conversation. We have maybe to uh, leave the surgical risk concept. This might be outdated. Only looking at the predicted risk of mortality no longer serves our patient population. So we have to consider suitability for TABOR or SABOR. And that means looking into patient-specific factors that lead to favoring one or the other. And this would also lead to optimal treatment strategies because they would be very much individualized. And this would also help to get a lifetime management plan. So when it comes to table saver suitability and to, to answer the question where TAB is equal or better to surgery, we have, of course, first to check anatomical suitability. This is for sure it's a prerequisite. But let's say we've done that. Then it's all about valve performance. And valve performance that basically is hemodynamics. If we look at hemodynamics, especially the Evolute Pro valve looks very good because the self-expanding stand has super annular valve position and of all devices has the largest active orifice area in relation to the annular size, leading to a three-fold increase in opening area and a radical decline in gradients. And we know also from the Loris trial that it is better compared to surgery. So we have higher effective orifice areas, significantly higher, uh, compared to surgery and lower gradients. And this is uh, the same for small, medium, and even large annulus. So even if you're a large annulus, you do better hemodynamically with the uh, TAVI compared to a surgical valve. But of course, the problem is most pronounced in small anatomies. In small anatomies, we have several problems. It's a, it's a prerequisite for preoperative complications sometimes. But today, we want to more speak about the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. This goes along with the high residual afterload and clearly with the less durable valve. 
So maybe a patient with small annulus, TAVI is the first choice. And we have data that shows us that moderate and severe patient prosthesis mismatch at 30 days is a higher problem in surgical beds than it is in TAVI beds. And this is most pronounced in small anatomies, where 30% of surgical patients actually have moderate or severe PPM, while only 8% of TAVI patients have it. And especially the degree of severe PPM is much, much less in TAVI compared to surgery. And PPM has a negative impact on mortality. If you have severe PPM, you have a 1.8-fold increase of mortality. With moderate PPM, you have a 1.2-fold increase in mortality, as could be shown by this meta analysis in more, like, in more uh, than 27,000 patients. And of course, the problem is also pronounced when it comes to valve and valve. TAVI and failed bioprosthesis, of course, deals with the smaller landing zone. And here we see the clear advantage for super annular valve position. Uh, when you compare self expanding super annular valves with the balloon expandable valves, you see much nicer gradients, much lower gradients. And therefore, this is a clear advantage for self expanding technologies. So let's speak about freedom from structural valve deterioration and durability. This is a real world data from the UK showing that the freedom from structural valve deterioration after whatever kind of TAVI is about 80% after eight years. And this is a very good value, by the way, and it's much comparable to what we know from surgical valves. The best data we have so far is from the Notion trial, because we really have a thorough echo follow-up here in patients eight years after uh, evolute or core valve implantation, showing that there is a lower risk uh, of structural valve deterioration for TAVI valves, leading to a lesser rate of SVD in this patient population. It's not yet clinically significant, but it's very close and a clear trend. So uh, to conclude, where is TAVI equal or better compared to surgery? Well, we clearly have better hemodynamics for TAVI compared to surgery, especially when it comes to smaller annually. To compensate for this effect, we have to change our surgical procedures, and they are thereby getting a bit more complex. So we have to do root enlargement, and many people like myself are doing it, but we also have to be honest that it's not done in every center. Structural valve deterioration and bioprosthetic valve failure. Here we see that TAVI is at least similar, maybe even better, compared to um, uh, surgical valve implantation. If that trend stays on and, and is uh, reliable, we will only know in the future and time will tell. Therefore, the choice of procedure at this very moment has to be very patient-oriented and should not be driven by risk assessment alone. Here we have the clear importance of the heart team that should decide in the best interest of the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, excellent presentation. And we can call ourselves very lucky that we not only have an excellent surgeon, but also a very experienced TAVI operator um, uh, in this panel. So, um, Hendrik, if I may ask two quick questions. In your personal practice, what is actually the patient group that you would select to shift to surgery uh, versus TAVR, and which are the criteria that will, you would use for TAVR? And the second one, what do you really think is the importance of PPM, patient procedures mismatch? Yeah, thank you, Hibbert. Um, when I um, approach a patient and ask myself if this is a good candidate for a saver or taver, I first ask myself, you know, what's the anatomy looking like? I don't ask so much what is the risk of the patient, uh, because there are clear indications that in some anatomies, TABOR is a perfect choice, in others, maybe it's not the case. So this is highly important that you look at the degree of classification, distribution of classification, you look at the access routes, and then you can see, is that a good candidate for a transfemoral TABOR? And if it turns out to be a very good candidate for a transfemoral TABOR, then it falls into the lowest patient trial population. And then we know that TABOR is better for surgery, at least for the first two years. Um, we, have, of course, have to wait longer, but uh, we will see data presented by Lars later on in the session on eight-year follow-up that shows that even after eight years, there is a trend that there might be even less structural lab situation for TABOR compared to surgery. So, if a patient is a very good TAVA candidate, I consider him being a TAVA candidate. But many patients are not. 
And then we should not push the envelope too far in my mind. I think then we should really also consider surgery, especially minimal invasive surgery, and even with root enlargement if, if needed, and uh, do this in a patient. And do not spend too much time on calculating risk uh, for these patients. And PPM, as Joss answered your second question shortly, I think is very important. PPM is a bad fate for patients. If you have it, you, your valve won't live as long and you yourself won't live as long. So we have definitely to avoid PPM whenever possible. Thank you, Hendrik. And I think I hand it over to Stefan now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eberhard. And uh, Hendrik, um, you, you have the privilege, you are a surgeon that is, uh, and you can do po both uh, procedures, uh, uh, TAVI and uh, surgery. And I'd like to ask you uh, two questions. One relates to the very first slide you have shown where there is an, uh, also a naturally an overlap area where you can do either uh, surgery or TAVI. In your practice currently, what is the proportion of procedures you do surgically? and you do a uh, uh, TAVI, that would be my first question to you. And how do you see that, let's say, five uh, or 10 years uh, uh, from now? And the second question would be regarding patient prosthesis mismatch. You nicely showed the impact it may have on uh, prognosis, on uh, mortality. But are there other patient uh, uh, related uh, outcomes uh, that are to be considered in terms of exercise capacity or whatsoever? Yeah, well, first of all, um, in our center in Mainz, we have about twice as many TAVIs as we have surgical AVRs. Um, so that's an average number. I think I see this moving more towards the TAVI direction in the future. I see us doing fewer patients surgically. And I personally don't think this is uh, something bad. Um, we have to wait long term data. If that data looks as good as we think it should look today, then we should just follow it because it's also what patients want us to do. Um, other factors than PPM, uh, we should definitely um, consider. And um, I think that we haven't spoke about that yet, but pacemakers and risk of PBL is something that we should definitely uh, have in mind when it comes to decision making. And that, of course, speaks more for surgical procedures uh, because they can basically avoid it or have much uh, fewer numbers that um, honestly, it's not a large problem, and it can be predicted pretty well when looking at CT scans beforehand. So it's something that we can rule out uh, quite nicely these days. So I handed over the next question to, to Lars. Uh, so Hendrik, when we're talking about uh, not only patient at low surgical risk, but patient with longer life expectancy, we, we need to take this lifetime management into consideration when we treat the patient. And we were talking about uh, hemodynamics and also durability of these valves, but eventually these fibrostatic valve is going to fail. So how do you see that in a lifetime management of these patients, uh, the possibility for revalving in a failed surgical or transcatheter heart valve? And this is a very good question, Lars, and it's very hard to answer, basically. Uh, from experience, I know that it's not a very big problem to reoperate on a patient who has a TAVI in place. Sometimes we have to do it for certain reasons, like endocarditis. And uh, so we could potentially even consider placing TAVI valves in younger patients with the option in mind that the next procedure might be an operation. It might not necessarily always be valve and valve and valve and valve because at a certain time point, this is no longer possible and the risk also of thrombus formation and stuff, which just increase the, the amount, of, uh, amount of material you place into a patient. So um, this is a very difficult question to answer, and the heart team has to sit together, and for that particular patient has to find the perfect solution. And this may well be target first place, or surgery in first place, and the target target or, or uh, target surgery. Um, this is all possible, and, and it's not a clear answer that we can, you know, decide now for every patient presenting a certain age or stuff, depending on life expectancy and other and other things. And, you know, I would rather last hand that question back to you. So how do you deal with that, actually? Yeah, as you said, we don't have any clear answer because um, failure of these uh, transcatheter heart valve had not been an issue, a big issue so far because the patient have limited life expectancy. 
But I think in the future, if you're going to, to treat patients who have maybe 20 or 30 years uh, remaining life expectancy, this is going to be a really important issue. And probably as we discussed, uh, the, the better hemodynamic we can have with the first valve, uh, the longer is the valve probably going to last and, and the longer you can wait before you need to revalve it. So I think that is certainly one thing you need to take into consideration, do a CT scan up front and make sure you know the size of the annulus and how you give the patient uh, the best hemodynamic outcome with the first valve. And then down the line, you have to make a consideration what's the pro and con for doing a, 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 a a Tavi and Tavi, or maybe explant a Tavi valve or put a surgical valve in, uh, it's going to be patient specific uh, uh, question. Yes, definitely. So the decision making process is a difficult one. And this is also the topic of the next talk that will be uh, given by my co chair, Stefan Winnecke. It's about patient age, risk factors, risk scores, and preference in decision making process. So, Stefan. My name is uh, Stefan Windecker, and I will address the issue of patient age, risk factors, risk scores, and preferences in the decision-making process of transcatheter aortic valve implantation versus surgical aortic valve replacement. These are my disclosures. Aortic stenosis represents one-third of native valvular disease in Europe, and there's an exponential increase in the prevalence of aortic stenosis with age, as you can recognize on the left-side graph. In the German aortic valve registry, which is depicted on the right side, you see the age distribution of patients undergoing transcatheter aortic valve implantation with a peak of a mean age of 85 years and the cumulative distribution for surgery with a peak in the age of 75 years of uh, uh, age. So clearly an elderly patient population. If we look at the outcomes of transcatheter aortic valve implantation versus surgery in this meta-analysis of seven randomized clinical trials and an outcome at two years, we recognize that in terms of all-cause mortality, outcomes are at least as good or slightly better for transcatheter aortic valve implantation with a 12% relative risk reduction. But the important message of this slide is that the benefit is irrespective of baseline surgical risk. If we look at risk scores for decision-making, we see on the left side the Euroscore 2 and the SDS score that have been used for surgical risk estimates, which only have modest performance when applied for transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Similarly, the four risk scores listed here in the middle of the slides all feature inferior outcomes, and it is only a machine learning-based risk score that performs better but uses procedural complications. And therefore, the utility of risk prediction models is limited as it uh, relates to transcatheter aortic valve implantation. During the past uh, two years, there has been an important paradigm shift whereby previous guidelines in 2012 and 2017 recommended a surgical risk-based categorization as to whether patients should be allocated to transcatheter aortic valve implantation or surgery. Following the publication of the low-risk trials, this no longer holds true and other factors, including age and life expectancy, anatomy, risk of complications, and comorbid conditions should be the basis for decision-making. An important consideration beyond the biological age is life expectancy. And there is agreement that among patients more than 80 years of age with a life expectancy of less than 10 years, transcatheter aortic valve implantation should be preferred because the prosthesis is expected to outlive the patient. The data is less strong in patients with a life expectancy between 15 to 20 years than it is above 65 years of age, where clearly we need longer-term follow-up and studies in lower-risk patients. However, one issue is that new valve iterations will be developed, and the data from the earlier generation's devices will be probably too late to change surgical interventional practice. In the most recent edition of the ACC-AHA guidelines, 
there is preference of transcatheter aortic valve implantation for patients above 80 years of age, whereas in patients 65 to 80 years of age, 80 years of age, there is an equal recommendation with a class 1A indication for either TAVI or surgery, as long as TAVI can be performed by the transfemoral route. However, these general recommendations need to factor in certain risk factors for TAVI, which may be unfavorable, including a bicuspid aortic valve, other risk factors of valve anatomy, as well as unfavorable femoral access and severe coronary artery disease and multivalve disease. If we turn to bicuspid aortic stenosis, it has been shown to be safe and feasible with acceptable one-year mortality rates. But we also realize that bicuspid valve anatomy is rather heterogeneous and that outcomes are inferior in patients with excessive calcification of leaflets and larafi. There's also a higher risk of stroke as compared to patients undergoing tricuspid intervention. There's a higher risk of permanent pacemaker implantation and there is a higher risk of annular rupture. So certainly more data are needed. These three high-risk settings, including aortic annular dimensions unsuitable for TAVI devices, as well as severe left ventricular outflow tract calcification, are associated with an increased risk of mild and moderate paravalvular leak, and in case of severe LVOT calcification, with an increased risk of annulus rupture. Similarly, a very low takeoff of the coronary arteries even if rare, is associated with a mortality risk that is considerable. Turning to unfavorable femoral access, we do know that uh, fortunately this proportion of patients is decreasing and constitutes only 5 to 10% of all TAVI eligible patients. But nevertheless, we know from randomized trials that the transthoracic access is inferior to transfemoral access and at this point in time, there is insufficient data to indicate which one is the best alternative access. Looking at patients that have aortic stenosis and concomitant coronary artery disease, there's also very limited data from randomized trials such as SOTAVI and PARTNER indicating that TAVI and PCI provide similar outcomes in terms of mortality and stroke as compared to cabbage and surgical aortic valve replacement. But clearly, these are selected uh, patients and more data are required. Finally, if we turn to patients with multivalve disease, that is patients with severe aortic stenosis and significant mitral regurgitation, significant mitral stenosis, and significant tricuspid regurgitation, surgery should be preferred over transcatheter aortic valve implantation if patients are at low surgical risk. As in treatment of the other valve lesions at this point in time is less standardized as transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Certainly, in the selection, patient preferences uh, play an important role. And as it relates to the procedure, TAVI is less invasive. It does not require cardiopulmonary bypass and prolonged ventilation. As it relates to the procedural risks, it is similar or lower in terms of mortality. There's a lower periprocedural stroke risk. and There's a lower risk of new onset atrial fibrillation, bleeding, and kidney injury. The early outcomes favor TAVI with a shorter hospitalization, faster return to normal life, and a better quality of life. However, there remain uncertainties as it relates to the long-term follow-up, including the coronary access issue, long-term data regarding durability, and the long-term consequences of permanent pacemaker and atrioventricular conduction abnormalities. I'm closing here, and thank you very much for your attention. It was an excellent presentation, and you covered a huge, you know, list of topics that are relevant to uh, today's TAVA world. Let me ask you a question, because there are many others, I suppose. When you look at the trials, too important that I would like to ask you the risk scores. Obviously, we have been following the STS score from the past Euroscore uh, from Europe. And uh, do you really think this is still relevant or should we change to a different stratification um, strategy? And second would be the low-risk trial. 
Uh, people talk about the low risk trial. I would like to ask you to still clarify the difference between low risk trial and young age. And also, do you think we're actually done by now with uh, with the trials? Should we do more? Yes, so, so many questions, uh, uh, Eberhard. First, uh, uh, let me address the issue of uh, uh, risk uh, scores. I think risk scores have been very useful in the surgical era, and we have to recognize that actually the SDS uh, score and probably also the Euroscore too have been rather accurate uh, to determine uh, perioperative uh, risk, uh, morbidity, and also uh, mortality. However, uh, they do not work uh, for the TAVI population. And what we have uh, seen over time with the strategy trials comparing TAVI versus surgery in high-risk patients, in intermediate-risk patients, and low-risk patients, that the outcomes were very consistent. So, in other words, uh, the risk scores are not needed to determine the relative risks and benefits of TAVI uh, versus uh, surgery. And therefore, and I think we are in agreement with Hendrik uh, as a, a surgeon and uh, as he outlined in his uh, previous uh, presentation, really the decision making in the future and now should be based on, on anatomy. Uh, feasibility in terms of the relative risk for either the TAVI or, 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 or surgery. And also, uh, in a certain uh, sense, age. And, and I think age uh, then addresses uh, your second question as to whether uh, the low-risk trials that have been uh, uh, completed uh, to date um, uh, reflect uh, um, younger patients. And there we clearly have to say uh, that this is not the case. Uh, the mean age uh, has been in the range of uh, above 70 years of age. So clearly uh, what we are missing are data in younger patients, less than 70 years of age uh, uh, in that segment of uh, uh, 60 to 70 years of age, we certainly have uh, insufficient uh, data. But I think uh, more data are coming uh, forward and uh, I think we will hear more from Lars, uh, uh, who not only did the Notion 1 trial, but is also doing the Notion 2 trial, where certainly lower risk uh, patients at younger age uh, uh, will be or are uh, uh, ongoing uh, to be included. Perfect. I think um, we have to hand over question to uh, Mohamed. Yeah, so so great talk, uh, Stefan. Um, I... I want to get back to the uh, anatomical um, issue you mentioned. So, I mean, in experienced hands, I think um, most of us fairly know well when a TAVI prosthesis will be functioning quite nicely and when the anatomy is hostile. But, I mean, in maybe in centers where the experience is less, do you think we need something that is more objective, like, I mean, similar to what we have in uh, coronary interventions, some sort of a syntax score for, for, for the aortic valve? Do you see this coming or are we going to be like just based on experience as we are doing now? Well, no, certainly we, we could continue to learn. And I think one example is, for, if, uh, for example, bicuspid valve uh, anatomy, where clearly our understanding has increased with systematic performance of uh, CT uh, imaging, where we do know if there is heavy calcification at the leaflets and, and uh, the raphi, uh, that uh, the outcome uh, with uh, TAVI may not be uh, uh, so favorable and where we may uh, shy away. I think a second very important consideration in that case of unfavorable anatomy from my point of view is age. I think in an elderly individual at high surgical risk, we would clearly do these patients with careful pre-procedural planning. But it's different in a 65-year-old patient where you don't want to take a risk and where you do know that surgery actually has an uh, excellent uh, uh, outcome. And I think we need to realize that there are certain procedures probably uh, limited to highly specialized uh, centers. So, for example, if 
do uh, uh, encounter patients with a very low coronary takeoff where you would consider a basilica procedure, not only valve in valve, but also in native, I think this is clearly something that should be limited uh, to very experienced and uh, few uh, tertiary uh, care uh, centers. So I think in the future, yes, we will become more standardized uh, in assessing objectively the risks. I think uh, CT scanning will be instrumental uh, to guide us in the uh, further accumulation of, of data. And uh, we will need to learn more also as it relates uh, to the issue of coronary artery disease. Maybe the syntax score plays here a role, but certainly I think uh, we need to, to, to study that particular issue in more uh, detail in, in the future. I think in the interest of uh, time, we need to transition uh, to the next uh, topic. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Lars uh, Sondergaard, a widely acknowledged TAVI expert and trialist uh, who has actually championed the notion trials. And Lars will speak about the longest follow-up data comparing TAVI versus uh, sur surgery, notion eight years and beyond. Lars, please. Thank you for the invitation to give the eight years outcome from the Notion trial. These are my potential conflict of interest. The Notion trial was actually conducted very early. It included patients in Denmark and Sweden between 2009 and 2013. The only criteria to be included in this study was that the patient was electable for both a transcatheter and a surgical aortic valve replacement and the patient needs to be at least 70 years of age. The primary endpoint was a composite all-cause mortality, stroke and myocardial infarction after one year. There was also a number of safety, efficacy and echocardiography outcomes. And if you look here at the baseline demographic, you can see that the patient were elderly, around 79 years of age, but also that the patient was at low surgical risk. So the mean STS score was around 3%, and around 85% of the patient actually had an STS score less than 4%, which at this point was defined as a low surgical risk. So if you start looking at all cause mortality out to eight years, you can see it's the same rate for both transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement. And also very interesting, at eight years, we still have half the patient alive, which is going to give us a unique opportunity to look at durability for these uh, valves. All-cause mortality, stroke, and myocardial infarction was the primary endpoint at one year. It was non-inferior after TAVI compared to surgical aortic valve replacement, and that was actually consistent out to eight years. Hemodynamic valve performance not surprisingly, using a self-expanding technology with a super inner leaflet position here as for the first generation core valve was superior compared to, to surgical aortic valve replacement. We had a larger opening area and a lower gradient, and this once again sustained out to eight years. Looking into durability, we used the European consensus report, which is dividing into valve dysfunction and valve failure. And within valve dysfunction, there's structural valve deterioration, non-structural valve deterioration, endocarditis, and valve thrombosis. But when we talk about durability, structural valve deterioration is of most interest. And according to the European consensus report, this is defined as a mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury, or a step up in gradient of at least 10 millimeter mercury from baseline, or at least a moderate central aortic regurgitation. It may be argued that this is not accounting for patients who have patient prestige mismatch. So to try to overcome that, we also use the modified definition of structural valve deterioration, meaning that the patient needs to have both a mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury and a step up in mean gradient of at least 10 millimeter mercury from baseline. And once again, applying this definition here to the notion uh, cohort, you see at eight years, there was a significant lower rate of structural valve deterioration after TAVI using the first generation core valve, 14% compared to surgical aortic valve replacement, where it was 
And the same pattern was found when we used the modified criteria where you both need to have a mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury and a step up of at least 10 millimeter mercury. So for surgical biprosthetic valve, it was 16%, and for transcatheter valve, it was only 9%. Moving from valve dysfunction to valve failure, which is defined as a valve-related death, aortic valve re-intervention, or severe structural valve deterioration with a mean gradient of at least 40 millimeter mercury, or a mean step up in mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury, or a central aortic regurgitation, which should be at least, or should be severe. Again, applying this to the notion cohort you see at eight years, there was no statistical significant uh, difference between transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement, despite numerically it was slower using the core valve, nine to seven percent, compared to surgery with 10 percent. So just to conclude from this eight years notion data, we can see that there was the same rate of all cause mortality and stroke for patients at lower surgical risk undergoing transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement. Hemodynamic, hemodynamic valve performance maintained superior after time compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. And structural valve deterioration and biprosthetic valve failure were similar for surgical and self-expanding transcatheter aortic valves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, a great, great uh, follow-up of this important uh, trial. First-generation core valve, quite surprising, uh, these, these outcomes. Obviously, you covered a very, very important topic uh, that has to do with uh, bioprostatic valve dysfunction failure, which is more important even as we move forward into younger patients. What is, you know, it has been quite a confusing story with uh, surgical definitions um, and, uh, and echo definitions and, and interventional definitions. What is your recommendation in order to compare surgical and um, TARVA data uh, on a forward going basis? And also importantly, as you have shown, what exams should be done when we follow up those patients that have been implanted a bioprosthetic valve? Yeah, yeah, Bahad, this is a good question. Uh, we know in the past um, the surgeons only reported valve failure as patient who underwent a re-intervention, but patient who was not offered a re-intervention due to high AIDS or high surgical risk was not accounted. So that's important why we need to have this consensus um, statement. And the first one we saw was from 2017, a European consensus and we just recently saw um, the VAC3 criteria also talking about this. So I think when we're going to report about durability for this valve, whether it's valve dysfunction or valve failure, we need to follow those uh, documents. Otherwise, we cannot compare the different uh, data. And also, of course, uh, to report on it, we need to systematically um, examine the patient using echocardiography, According to the guidelines, the patient should undergo not only a clinical, but also an echocardiography examination after one to three months uh, after the procedure, and then after one year and every year afterwards. If you don't do that, it's going to be very important, very difficult to have any uh, strong conclusion on which valve is, um, is durable and which valve uh, do have a much shorter durability. Thank you. Stefan, you... Take over. Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Lars. You, you, you have, um, I think, uh, main uh, described the phenomenon also of halt and the role of thrombosis. Mm. And I guess my question is, we have very good data out to year, eight years now in the Notion trial. What do you think we can do as physicians on, on the pharmacological end to improve uh, long-term uh, outcomes? You pointed to the importance of longitudinal echocardiographic follow-up, but what should be the pharmacological uh, uh, standard treatment? Yeah, As you know, there's four parts of this um, valve dysfunction. One is uh, valve thrombosis, but valve thrombosis means that the patient has clinical valve thrombosis with, with high gradient and, and often symptoms. This hold or ham or subclinical lethal thrombosis, the patient have no symptoms and the gradient is within the normal range. There was a lot of discussion in the beginning whether this was going to have any clinical impact for the patient. Would it cause stroke or TIA? Would it translate into clinical valve thrombosis uh, with high gradients and symptoms? Or would it impact uh, the durability of these valves? 
so far we have no uh, evidence that is going to affect the outcome for the patient. So I think just to, con to, to conclude on this one, do not look for it and do not treat uh, these uh, imaging findings if the patient has no symptoms and if it's outside any studies. Back to your questions about antithrombotic therapy. I mean, we have seen again that uh, this subclinical thrombosis is less frequent on patients who's going on anticoagulation compared to antiplaque therapy. But again, it doesn't have any clinical impact on the patient. And on the other hand, we have seen both the Galileo trial and the Popular trial that patients who received um, more than just aspirin have dual antiplatelet therapy after TAVI, or if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, if you combine anti oral anticoagulation with antiplatelet therapy, the patient is going to have a worse outcome, higher mortality rate. So for the elderly and frail patient we treat today, I think you can say for antithrombotic therapy, that less is actually more for these patients. Don't give it the too much more than actually needed. That's a very important uh, take-home uh, message. I turn for the next uh, question to Hendrik. Yes, Lars. Um, I know that in the surgical community, when we discuss about the notion trial, you always hear um, the rumors that maybe the valves that have been implanted in the surgical arm have been small valves, and therefore the PPM uh, incidence was higher in surgical arm. Maybe you can refer to that because I know that you looked into it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we used the valve, which was uh, the standard at the institution at that time. And we also looked into uh, the, the true inner diameter of the valve we used and what was used in uh, the other randomized trials between transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement. And there was no difference. It was the same uh, tr true inner diameter for this valve in the notion trial compared to the other trials, the partner trials, um, the core valve uh, extreme and high risk trials, uh, the Sotavi trials, and the Evolute low risk. Yes, and if I may comment, um, the only way to overcome this is the surgical fate um, uh, that the opening area of uh, surgical valves is necessarily smaller because they are not super angular, not in the same way super angular than the Tavi valves are. The only answer to that would be root enlargement. That was also a question from the chat if root enlargement would be then your solution for surgical side. Yes, somehow it is. If you have small annulus, you can do this. And uh, if there's something good about the whole discussion, then that surgeons should now learn to make this part of the armamentarium and enlarge annually to place larger valves on the surgical side too, because it's very important that patients do not end up with the higher gradients and longer term follow up, no matter if they are being treated with taper or saber. Um, also, I think in direct, that's why it's important to have a CT scan in all patients who can undergo surgery and transcatheter auto valve replacement before the decision making and identify the patient who are at risk for severe patient procedure mismatch and then make the decision is the patient better served with transcatheter auto valve replacement or if the patient is going for surgery, yeah. should root enlargement be part of this uh, uh, the package? That's a very important point. I think it's more and more done now also in surgical candidates. Uh, we have to move on, and there are some remaining considerations that we have to take into account when it comes to decision making. And uh, Mohamed Abdel Baha, a good friend of mine, an excellent Harvey implanter and expert in the field, is going to address this field. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, so my topic in the next uh, few minutes uh, will be to talk about remaining considerations in the valve selection process. Uh, these are my disclosures. And I'll start with this case, which is a case uh, from our lab um, presented to us a few days ago, um, which uh, I thought is very useful to demonstrate a few important considerations in the valve type selection process um, um, that is uh, really part of our daily uh, heart team discussion. This is a 75 years old female who has some hypertension and obesity. Um, she presented with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, she didn't have any concomitant uh, coronary artery disease. And as you can see here, she had a suitable transfemoral axis, um, but has a very small analyst um, with a mean diameter of 18.9 millimeter. Um, our understanding of the valve type selection process has changed in the last years. We were focusing in the past on procedural success. And this is, of course, uh, important and remains important. Um, but uh, in the context of 
the risk creep towards lower risk patients who have longer life expectancy, um, we definitely need to look ahead of the procedure and think about lifetime management uh, uh, issues. Um, and a lot of these issues you have heard of in the session, they include hemodynamics, they include the durability, uh, they include also re-interventions on the coronary and the valvular aspects. And all these uh, considerations are part of the valve type selection process um, in our daily practice. These considerations can be summarized here on the slide. I uh, like to call them like um, anatomical or local factors, uh, such as uh, the calcification pattern, the location of the coronaries, the analyst size, etc. And there are uh, clinical or global factors we just mentioned, including age, life expectancy, daily activity, concomitant disease. But we um, have also um, additional uh, like logistic or administrative factors, which include experience and availability of devices and so on and so forth. And importantly, these factors interact um, and it's difficult to divide them in an abstract manner. And we'll talk about this in a moment. What adds to the sometimes difficult discussion in the heart team is that a few years ago, we had actually much more available devices than we have today. So a lot of these devices have just disappeared from the market and they're not available anymore. Some of these devices had advantages in certain anatomical subtypes or for certain uh, longevity considerations. And now we have to deal with the this three or four available devices in our daily routine, which makes discussions and considerations uh, sometimes a little bit more difficult. If we consider the case I presented, one of the local factors I want to present here is the small analyst or small anatomy. Um, you've seen, of course, the data Lars has presented concerning the hemodynamic advantages of a um, supraannular device compared to an intraannular one. And this is of particular importance in patients with a small analyst. This is a, an analysis from uh, the Choice Extent Registry we did a few years ago. And you can see here that the choice of the device, in this case, the Evolute valve compared to the Sapien 3 valve, um, was actually the most important predictor of prosthesis patient mismatch in patients who have a small anatomy. This is important, and this will be further verified in a prospective randomized trial, the SMART trial, in which 700 patients or more than 700 patients with a small anatomy will be randomized between these two types of devices. And I think from the study, which has recently started uh, inclusion, uh, we will learn a, a lot of information in the device selection process in patients with small anatomy. Um, if we shift from this local factor to, again, a global factor, which is life expectancy, again, hemodynamics play a role. These are data from the CHOICE trial at five years, where we compared the older generation devices, the Colvin and the Sapien XT, um, in a randomized pattern. And you can see here again, the favorable hemodynamics of the supraannular device compared to the intraannular device, which is some more or less reflected also in the incidence of structure de degeneration, structure valve deterioration at five years, which was in this study, higher with the balloon expandable device compared to the cell expanding one. Of course, these are still uh, preliminary data. They are, these are data with older generation devices, but it more or less more or less fits also to what we know from the uh, surgical uh, um, uh, comparisons um, in the partner trial and in the evolute low risk trial. On the other hand, implanting a device that has favorable hemodynamics in a small anatomy and maybe a better longevity could be problematic if we consider redo procedures. It could be problematic if we consider redo TAVI just because the location of the leaflets in the supra in a supraannular position could have more interference with the coronary arteries if you consider uh, a redo TAVI procedure. Um, this is a case we did uh, recently uh, where we um, 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 decided to uh, 
split or lacerate the left coronary leaflet with the basilica type of procedure before doing a redo tavi procedure, before doing a valve and valve procedure uh, in a degenerated core valve in order to protect the coronaries. This appeared to be feasible in this particular case, um, but definitely this is something that um, is evolving uh, and will be important in valve type uh, selection, in the valve type selection process when we consider patients that potentially will need a redo procedure in the future. The same applies for coronary access. So shorter devices could uh, allow uh, in more easily um, coronary access in the future, while longer devices may interfere with the coronary access in a more significant way. We uh, now understand um, a couple of things that relate to this, but we also have some solutions. Um, solutions um, um, during the initial implantation process where we could, for example, aim at aligning the native commissures with the native commissures in order to facilitate both redo coronary interventions and redo valvular interventions. And to uh, um, summarize this in the context of the case we presented in the beginning, we decided in this particular case um, uh, um, based on the small uh, annular size and based on the expected hemodynamic benefits of a supra annular device, uh, we decided to use here an Evolute Pro 23 millimeter device. We implanted it in the cusp overlap view in order to avoid pacemaker uh, implantation and to assess implant depth, but also to obtain uh, adequate commercial alignment, as you can see here on both of these slides. We ended up with a mean gradient echocardiography of eight and no conduction abnormalities, which is something I think in this very small anatomy could be associated with favorable long-term outcomes. Um, so uh, to summarize what we discussed uh, on this uh, last slide, these different factors that interact, the um, um, challenge of um, the daily heart team discussions is nowadays not only to decide between TAVI and surgery, but also to decide on the uh, valve that best fits into the patient, uh, into the patient's anatomy, but also in the patient's expectations uh, for uh, long-term outcomes. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, valve selection, obviously, also very controversial. Um, can I ask you a, a person, not a person, but ask you a question where you should weigh in uh, and give your personal perspective. If we look at the um, at the balloon expandable valves, it obviously makes a difference to look at the different um, uh, the different iteration of of the valve. Uh, the, the devices are different and balloon expandable, it looks like looking at the notion trial that this is not so much the case uh, with balloon expandable, at least with the core valve uh, Evolute uh, edition, if I may say. Do you think we have to expect to look carefully uh, and separate uh, the question of um, uh, structural valve deterioration or, or failure, looking at the two different valves, do we expect something to happen um, in future editions of, of Evolute as compared to the uh, change of XT to S3? This is a very good question. So, so I personally don't think that these iterations in device technology, um, both for the balloon and for the self-expanding devices, that they should make a big difference in longevity. Uh, because the iterations that have been performed, maybe apart from some modification of uh, like leaflet preparation, which I think is minor personally, um, they are mainly related to um, better sealing, which is probably not related to, to, the, to the valve performance and hemodynamics, which would therefore, in my opinion, shouldn't affect long-term outcome or related to valve positioning and the setting of the self-expanding devices uh, in order to allow more precise positioning. So the leaflets themselves, I don't think they have changed a lot. And this is why I don't, I don't personally believe that this should have an outcome or an impact on, on durability. I, I think that the differences we see uh, between XT and S3 First of all, you cannot compare directly because these are not directly 
have not been directly randomized, but you're extrapolating from different studies. But they may be due to changes in practice. I mean, we've seen what we do, uh, what we obtained hemodynamically with a valve that is supraanion position, but also that is a little bit more oversized to patients' anatomy. And what we have, I think, with the modern balloon expandable devices, we tend to less oversize. And maybe this comes at the cost of a little bit worse hemodynamics. I'm not sure this is the case, but could be an explanation. Okay. Mohamed, well, I can also ask you a question. Um, we have seen some iterations of the valve, for sure, um, and you were mentioning it. But we have also seen iterations in the technique how we implant the valves. And just recently with the Evolute, there have been iterations that are now, you know, commonly um, done in, in, in practice, like cast overlay and, uh, and commercial alignment and, and things like this. Um, just looking at the technical aspects, do you think that this will make a change in the long-term durability of valves and has an impact also on the choice of valves uh, in younger patients? Yeah, again, I think this is important. I'm, I'm not sure whether, again, it will impact durability. It could be, but more importantly, it gives us a little bit more freedom in deciding how to implant a particular device in a particular patient. I think we, in the future, we, we, we should a little bit go away from implanting the device the same way in every single patient. This is something we used to do. We like we changed practice and then we started to implant higher up, higher up, higher up. And then we, for example, the recommendations to plan high in all patients to reduce pacemaker rates. We shouldn't forget that this could come at the cost of, for example, um, coronary access or like more difficult uh, valve and valve procedures. Um, so we, we may be like, I mean, it, we have tools now. We can implant valves more precisely. So maybe we should adapt this to the patient needs and patient's anatomy. It's if we are expecting that this patient will require a pacemaker, then we can implant higher up. If we are expecting this patient will probably need coronary access, then we may be not aiming at implanting at zero uh, millimeter depth. And the same also applies to commercial alignment. We have a tool that can facilitate probably redo procedures or re-interventions, but maybe it's not necessary to insist on it in a 90 years old lady who doesn't have coronary artery disease. So, so I think these techniques are very helpful. They give us tools, they give us, give us freedom. Um, and probably by this way, by selection, we can improve outcomes. Yeah, very short uh, and uh, question and answer. You were mentioning the smart trial. Uh, aside from that and others that are being uh, now under development, what is the number one trial you'd love to see in Tavi right now? Oh, it's a good question. <laughs> One trial's done. <laughs> um, so maybe I, I, I th I'm thinking of two, actually. I'm thinking of a device-device comparison in bicuspids, particularly in bicuspids that we think are treatable, as Stefan mentioned. So I think we know now which bicuspids we can treat and which not. And it's interesting to know the comparative efficacy of devices. And the second one, I mean, I like comparing devices, as you know, would be maybe a trial looking at long-term durability. Yeah, thank you very much, Mohamed. Unfortunately, we run out of time. But we could have this discussion for a much longer time. Um, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. I think it was an excellent uh, symposium, and uh, we have had good discussions and very didactic and clear presentations. Thanks to all of you. And also thanks to Medtronic for sponsoring this session. What I learned in this session is that now that we definitely move towards younger patient populations, uh, lower risk patient populations, the heart team carries a much higher responsibility because we have to consider long-term outcome of patients much more than only short-term outcome. And this is a difficult task and we are not there yet. I have I personally, I'm not sure the very thing that we discuss uh, in the heart team will turn out to be true in the future. But we have to take the right decisions. And I think we mentioned some points that are of high importance. Uh, high important to me is hemodynamics. We have to make sure that we end up with the best hemodynamics uh, after target implantation. We, uh, the next step would be coronary access, especially in those patients who come up with coronary artery disease. Uh, there are now techniques that also you know, leave better access to, uh, to the coronary Ostia after Tavi implantation. And of course, the uh, overwhelming problem of structural valve deterioration. 
Uh, we will see, we only will see because there's no data yet, but there is another or more of a problem in Tarby as it is in surgery, in surgical valves. It's not clear yet. We we'll just have to wait. But uh, we know that uh, by influencing hemodynamics and other factors, we can also influence, positively influence structural valve uh, deterioration. And um, uh, with this, uh, I really thank you uh, all for, for participating in this great symposium. I learned a lot. I hope that all the uh, people in the audience did also learn a lot. And uh, I wish all of you a great and ongoing EuroPCR.